breath. Please, can everybody be seated? The Honourable President Cyril Ramaphosa, Minister Pravin Gordon. <clears throat> Minister Zweli McKees. <laughs> Minister Mike Masuta. <laughs> Chief Rabbi Goldstein and Honoured Rabbanim. <laughs> Members of the Mandela family, Kweku and Daba to Queenie Mandela, and members of the Coleman family. Ambassadors and diplomats from the embassies and high commissions of the People's Republic of China, Egypt, Hungary, Israel, Japan, Lithuania, the Russian Federation, the United Arab Emirates, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Leaders of the ANC, DA, ACDP, COPE and the UDM, members of parliament, communal leaders and members of the judiciary, special mention of Veronica Phillips, a survivor of the Holocaust and our honoured guest. and importantly, honoured friends of the South African Jewish community and the South African community. On behalf of the South African Jewish Board of Deputies, I welcome you to our biennial Gauteng Conference. Next week is the festival of Hanukkah. At one of the darkest periods of Jewish history, a tiny drop of oil was able to ignite a vibrant and lasting flame that brought light into the world. Every year, we rejoice this miracle. The celebration of light at a time that was dark, depressing and hopeless for the Jewish people. For eight days, we light the Chanukiah and sing songs of joy and celebration at the triumph of light over darkness. On Hanukkah, we start with one candle, building up to two on the second night and every subsequent night till all, can all eight candles of the Hanukkah burn brightly and radiantly. There were times in our country where we started to feel bleak and hopeless and then a flame of positivity and optimism was ignited. Just like on Hanukkah, we build up the light incrementally and not just overnight. So too in our country, it is a slow process of rebuilding, regrowth and rebirth. We will now start the evening with messages from Chief Rabbi Warren Goldstein, His Excellency Ambassador Lior K. Nunn and Fani Titi, the joint CEO of Investec. To answer this question, we need to go back in time, more than 2,200 years. There was a sovereign Jewish state in the land of Israel way back then already, and then it was occupied and invaded by the Greek Empire. And the leadership of the Greek Empire imposed tyrannical rule, and they snuffed out the most basic of human freedoms, the freedom of religion, the freedom of conscience, the freedom of association and they imposed a ban on the practice of Judaism in the land of Israel. And the Jewish people rebelled. And they were led by the mighty warriors, the Maccabees, with their bravery. And they rebelled against the Greek Empire. 
and through the incredible miracles of God were able to overthrow the power of the Greek Empire and to restore freedom to the land of Israel. And they rededicated the temple and lit the candelabrum, the menorah. And we remember these events and the great miracles that led to these events. We remember them during the festival of Hanukkah, which we are about to celebrate as part of the Jewish calendar. And on Hanukkah, we light the Hanukkah candles to remind ourselves of the miracles and the great victories that led to the restoration of freedom in the land of Israel. And it's also an opportunity to think about what the Maccabees were fighting for, the values. The lights of the Hanukkah candles represent the values that they were fighting for but also the value of freedom to be able to worship God in the way that we want. And that is something which is so important. And so when we light our Hanukkah candles, it gives us an opportunity to reflect as well on the fact that we have freedom here in South Africa and to acknowledge the blessing of what that is. Because here in South Africa, we have a constitution. We have a Bill of Rights which protects and enshrines freedom freedom of association, freedom of religion, freedom to worship God as we want to in accordance with the traditions of our ancestors. And so we celebrate that freedom and acknowledge it because it was a freedom which did not come easily. And on this occasion of this gathering and this conference, we pay tribute and remember Nelson Mandela and everything that he stood for and the liberation movement that liberated South Africa and gave us the incredible benefits and the gifts and the blessings of freedom. And we acknowledge what that freedom is and we acknowledge and pay tribute to the Bill of Rights and to the South African Constitution and to South African society that we as the Jewish community together with all faith communities can worship God freely with freedom to choose how we do that. And we can do so in accordance with the tradition of our ancestors as the generations who came before us worship God for thousands and thousands of years. We have that opportunity to this day and we give thanks for that with incredible gratitude. And we pay tribute and acknowledge the presence of President Sora Maposa at this gathering, a president who has dedicated himself to uprooting corruption from South Africa a president who has dedicated himself to bringing a new, fresh atmosphere of optimism and hope for the future, determined to build a better country for us all. And we pledge our support and our partnership to the president in doing so. And I would also like to pay tribute to the South African Jewish Board of Deputies for the important and vital work which they do in protection and lobbying in defense of the civil rights of the Jewish community of South Africa. That is, that is something which is so important. These freedoms which are entrenched in our Constitution and the Bill of Rights need to be protected and need to be defended at every turn. And we thank the Board of Deputies for doing so. And so, friends, on the eve of this year's Hanukkah, let us take this opportunity to recall the great victories and miracles of the past and to rededicate ourselves to the values of the lights of the Hanukkah candles and to do so with optimism and faith in the future, with an appreciation of where we come from and the incredible blessings which we enjoy here in South Africa. May God bless us all. President of South Africa, Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa, Chief Rabbi Goldstein, member of the Jewish Board of Deputies, member of the Jewish community, distinguished guest, Good evening. Thank you for inviting me to address the conference of the Gauteng Board of Deputies for 2018. 2018 marked the 100th anniversary for the birth of one of the greatest leaders in modern history, Nelson Mandela. His legacy should be a beacon to next future generation here in South Africa and around the world. 2018 also marks the 70th anniversary for the State of Israel. Another great statesman, David Ben-Gurion, said that in Israel, if you don't believe in miracles, you are not a realistic. Indeed, so many miracles in such a short time, we have to take it as rea reality. Not only our economy will have had a great moment lately, we also are improving our political relationship with the rest of the world. In Africa, as a continent, 
We had so many visitors, so many delegations coming from African nations to Israel and vice versa. Israel is about to open more embassies and trade offices in Africa, in Rwanda, in Ghana, another trade office in Kenya. We want to offer our experience for the challenges that us African nations are facing in order to improve the daily life of their people. As Israel improved its relation with most of the big BRICS countries, I hope that we'll, we'll do the same with South Africa as well. Israel has so much to contribute to South Africa in those fields that I just mentioned, but it's important to remember that South Africa has so much to offer to Israel as well. South Africa is a marvelous example how to finish a very complicated conflict in a peaceful way, with no blood and no violence. Surely it can contribute from its experience to the people of the Middle East, also in fields of trade, fighting unemployment, increasing tourism. We can share and we can contribute to each other so much. The Jewish community here in South Africa is an important bridge to all those elements, to the connection between the two countries. This is the right moment for me to thank the Jewish community, the Board of Deputies, for the cooperation with me and with my embassy. I want to congratulate the Gauteng Board of Deputies for arranging this marvelous evening, and I wish you all a good night. Mr. President, Mr. Ambassador, Chief Rabbi Dr. Warren Goldstein, distinguished guests, our thanks to the South African Jewish Board of Deputies for the opportunity to be part of this momentous event. It is a tremendous honor for all of us at Investec to be celebrating Nelson Mandela's legacy and to be continuing our proud and long-standing association with the South African Jewish community. As a country, we stand at a crossroads between economic recovery and a continuation of the wasted opportunities that have characterized our country's recent history. But the signposts are clear. The path to success is through the promotion of inclusive growth and the creation of jobs. In this audience tonight are captains of industry in a community whose entrepreneurial spirit is helping to create the growth and employment opportunities that we so desperately need. As part of Corporate South Africa, Investec has a role to play. We have been working closely with government, business and labor to help change the narrative around the role of the corporate sector in South Africa and to position business as a key contributor to solving the challenges we face. Our president's presence here tonight is testament to the important role that this community can play in moving this country forward towards a prosperous future. Tonight, we honor the legacy of Nelson Mandela. We also applaud the contribution of members of the Jewish community who fought against the injustice of apartheid and helped turn around a seemingly impossible situation. This is not the first time South Africa has found itself at a crossroads. We have every confidence that strong leadership, a vibrant, thriving business sector, and a committed, energized society will once again steer us onto the right path. When we see the struggle and the mothers walking for hours every single day with the hope to find water that they know will make them sick. And yet, there is so much water right beneath their feet. And just by using a few solar panels, we're able to bring water to thousands of people. Innovation Africa was founded 10 years ago with a very simple mission to bring Israeli technologies to transform schools, medical centers, but most importantly, to pump water. The women in the community have to walk five, 10 kilometers to go and get dirty water and bring that water back into the village. How would you know we, people who work and live in Johannesburg, feel if we never had water? That's when we started the water project. 
So far, we've done 10 projects in Kumalanga to get the thing off the ground and then get other players to come in so that we could ultimately do a few hundred villages. We're delighted with the outcomes. He's delivered the 10 villages in half the original time using local contractors, local people to help deliver with Innovation Africa team actually playing the supervision role and the motivation role to actually get the job done. What we have to understand about South Africa is you've got this cross between a developed society and then you've got the underdeveloped part of our society, which in particular would be the rural areas and the townships. Most major South African corporates understand the need to play a role in helping uplift society. And we've always believed at Investec that we live in society, not off it. What I like about the way Innovation Africa work is that they get the whole village involved in the project. Innovation Africa will provide them with the technology, but it is up to the villagers to look after the tower. From the moment we identify the village to the moment we open the tap, we work together. It's a strong partnership, and that's what makes the project to be sustainable. For me, I'm a big believer in growth, and that growth can drive transformation by making a difference to communities, like we're trying to do with the water projects, you're starting to uplift people. Once you uplift them from poverty, then they have hope. And when they have hope, they will start innovating. And that's what we're trying to achieve here. They can grow food. They're healthier. Children are now able to go to school because they don't have to look for water anymore. I think that all of us who live in this country want to see the country grow and develop. So we all have a responsibility, each of us in a different way, to help make a difference to our society. Certainly those of us who were fortunate enough to have prospered, you know, within the country, need to give back. I will now call on our Gauteng Chairman, Mark Pasniak, to present his Chairman's message. <clears throat> his Excellency, President Cyril Ramaphosa, esteemed Rabonim, dignitaries, honoured guests, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here to this biennial Congress of the South African Jewish Board of Deputies Gauteng Council. Since its establishment 115 years ago, the Sage Board has represented the South African Jewish community, promoting its welfare and upholding the safety and civil rights of its members. It is an honour and a privilege for me to have served as Chair of this Council and to be able to give opening remarks here tonight. Before I begin, I must say that my wonderful wife has spent the last 11 years convincing me that her birthday is not so much a day but a full month of celebration. And so with that said, I have no compunction in saying, Mr. President, happy birthday for eight days ago because by her counting, we're still right on time, no problem. The <clears throat> Just under a quarter of a century has passed since our country's momentous transition from minority rule to democracy. During that time, the crucial focus of government and civil society has inevitably been on addressing the, disgust, the destructive legacy of our apartheid and colonialist past. In this regard, important strides have undoubtedly been made. But on the other hand, no one can deny that in many ways, the high hopes that accompanied the democratic transition have not been realised, and that today, our country is facing very real challenges. Confronting and overcoming these challenges is not the responsibility of government alone. Rather, 
All South Africans have a duty to do whatever they can to make a positive difference. As a community, South African Jewry is faced with a choice. Will we engage and play a meaningful role in striving for solutions? Or will we choose instead to be passive onlookers? As a people, Jews are instructed to be a light unto the nations. Far from this signifying a sense of superiority on our part, it is in fact a call to action, a moral duty that we must all strive to live up to. We have a responsibility to do everything we can to contribute more than we consume, to give more than we take. Whether it in such practical fields as economic growth, education, job creation, or in the more abstract but equally important sphere of fostering a culture of democracy and equality. SA Jury has much to contribute, and I am confident that as in years gone by, it will not be found wanting. We simply cannot be found wanting. I therefore take this opportunity, Mr. President, to pledge the unstinting commitment of the Jewish community to assist you wherever we can in addressing the problems facing our country and in making South Africa the success story we know it can be. However, here it is necessary to introduce a cautionary note. Abraham Lincoln's famous dictum that a house divided against itself cannot stand applies as much to South Africa in 2018 as it did to the United States in the 1850s. Ours continues to be a deeply divided society, and one of the most divisive factors is the prevalence of racism in the workplace, social media, schools, the political arena, and indeed in ordinary day-to-day -day interaction. It is particularly concerning that instead of setting an example by strenuously opposing these trends, numerous political leaders have increasingly been guilty of exacerbating the situation. The introduction of race and fear of the other into our political narrative is something that must be addressed as a matter of urgency, Mr. President. Because contrary to what we were all taught as children, that sticks and stones will break my bones but words will never harm me, the sad truth is that words matter. Vicky Momberg's words mattered. Adam Katsavalis's words matter. And so too do those of Tony Ehrenreich and Bongani Musuku, two leaders who we are pursuing throughout all legal avenues appropriate to us based on words that they, that they spoke. Because words have consequences. Even when hateful statements do not lead to harmful acts, they serve to poison relations between different sectors of our population. And they seriously undermine the kind of unity and vision that is of critical importance to our countries overcoming the challenges that we face. The kind of unity that Nelson Mandela, whose centenary we are here celebrating tonight, recognized as essential and fought for. Please let me be clear. This does not mean shying away from confronting the very real issues pertaining to race. In particular, the tremendous socio-economic inequalities inherited from our apartheid past, but rather approaching them in a spirit of inclusion and mutual respect. By the same token, I urge our Jewish community to likewise adopt a zero-tolerance approach to all forms of racism. <clears throat> A 
As a community, we reject racism, but that is not enough. It is what we do as individuals that will have far more consequence than what we ascribe to as a collective. What we teach our children about the other is what will ultimately define our success in this regard. Looking beyond our borders, an issue of much concern to our community is that of South Africa's relationship with Israel. Regrettably, this is coming under continual attack by certain hardline anti-Israel groupings whose aim is not to support peace efforts, but to boycott and isolate the Jewish state in every conceivable forum. The SAJBD strongly opposes the politics of boycott. Not only, not only is it contrary to how we as South Africa manage our foreign affairs, but it generally will remove us from playing any form of meaningful role in the resolution of the conflict. We are encouraged, President Ramaphosa, by your recent statements reiterating government's continued support for a negotiated two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian question. As the South African Jewish Board of Deputies, we too are committed to a two-state solution. And in that regard, the Jewish community is ready and willing to assist in any way it can in this regard. I would like to conclude with a challenge to both the broader South African society and to the Jewish community. To the first I say, you have a Jewish community here that is not only willing and able, but eager to help in whichever way possible to make our country a better place. And to the South African Jewish community, my challenge to you, to all of us, is that we stand up and become more a part of South African society, to be there in whichever way is needed, to build our country into the country we believe it can and hopefully will become. Thank you. In June 1903, Jewish leaders met in Johannesburg to establish a Jewish Board of Deputies to watch and take action with reference to all matters affecting the welfare of Transvaal and Natal Jews. In 1912, following the unification of South Africa, the Board became a nationally based body that represented Jews throughout the country. From the outset, the organisation has played an integral part in the history of South African Jewry. As the representative voice of the Jewish community, the SAJBD maintains effective channels of communication and fosters close working relationships with leading figures in the political, academic, media and civil society arena. Through this, it ensures that the voice of the community is heard on all issues that concern it. The board vigorously combats all forms of anti-Semitism, whether in the media, the political realm, in the workplace or anywhere else where it occurs. It draws on its legal, media and diplomatic resources to confront anti-Jewish activity and propaganda and liaises closely with international Jewish organisations working in that field. As the representative voice of South African Jewry, the SAJBD leads the community in identifying with and contributing to all aspects of South African society as involved patriotic citizens. It further works to promote and protect South Africa's diverse and vibrant Jewish heritage and to foster communal unity. The board builds bridges of friendship and understanding between Jews and their fellow South Africans, engaging in interfaith dialogue and participating in various forums aimed at bringing South Africans of all races and breeds together in celebrating their common values. In today's global village, the SAJBD maintains close working relationships with international Jewish organisations. Through these connections, it shares skills and information in addressing such common issues as anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism and inter-religious dialogue. Through its communications department, 
The board promotes and publicizes the activities of the Jewish community and a positive image of the community and its heritage. It responds to anti-Jewish and anti-Israel bias in the media and educates the wider public regarding Jewish religion, history and culture. Yom Hashoah ceremonies are held each year under the auspices of the board in all the major centers countrywide. These moving and solemn occasions ensure that the six million victims of Nazi tyranny are not forgotten and raise awareness of the dangers of anti-Semitism and racism. The board's country communities department assists Jews in small country towns in remaining connected to their heritage and the greater Jewish community. It is headed by a country communities rabbi who regularly visits Jews living in areas outside the main Jewish population centers, officiating at festival services and life cycle events. The country communities department is also responsible for the maintenance of over 220 country Jewish cemeteries. Another regular community service performed by the SHABD is working with the relevant universities to resolve problems where examinations have been set on Shabbat or Yom Tov. For more than a century, the South African Jewish Board of Deputies has strenuously pursued its mandate to ensure that South Africa remains a country where Jewish life can continue to thrive. At the same time, it remains committed to leading the Jewish community and contributing to the building of a just, peaceful and prosperous society. Whatever challenges the future might bring, the Jewish community of South Africa can feel confident that it has a vigilant, proactive and hands-on representative body to act on its behalf and safeguard its interests. President Cyril Ramaphosa, honored guests, friends, ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege as the National Chairman of the South African Jewish Board of Deputies to introduce the next section of this evening's program. In September this year, Mr. Ramaphosa spoke to the Jewish community in Cape Town. It was the first time he had addressed a Jewish communal gathering since his assuming the presidency in the beginning of this year. He has now graciously agreed to speak to our community in Gauteng, and we are deeply honored to host him tonight for this important occasion on the Jewish communal calendar. Joining President Ramaphosa in conversation will be one of our community's most distinguished business leaders, Stephen Kossoff, founder and long-serving chairman of the generous hosts of this conference, Investec. They will be sharing ideas and perspectives on the kind of challenges currently facing our country and how best to overcome them. Mr. President, I recall hearing an address from you in 1991 when you were the General Secretary of the National Union of Mine Workers. It was a time of extreme uncertainty and anxiety. And I recall vividly how your visionary approach and embracing style inspired us all with the belief that we would emerge triumphant. It is nearly three decades later, and we have all been blessed to have been part of a miraculous and peaceful transition from tyranny to freedom. And yet, challenges remain. The vast majority of South Africans have not been uplifted economically. The scourge of corruption threatens to corrode our collective, our collective morality, and state institutions run the risk of being undermined. In addition, from the Jewish community's perspective, incidents of anti-Semitism at senior levels in political parties are not being censured, and the ANC is embracing a foreign policy which is likely to exclude South African involvement in the resolution of the Middle East crisis, and which will be deeply offensive to a significant proportion of South Africans. Given these challenges, we are deeply grateful that a leader of your stature has emerged and are looking forward to hearing how you intend dealing with these issues. We know from our recent history that we as South Africans have the capacity to rise above what undermines our progress as a society and keeps us divided to forge a positive, hopeful future together. 
In speaking to our community in Cape Town, Mr. President, you said that the Jewish community of South Africa are seen by your government as being valued partners in building a better society for all. I would like to reiterate the pledge just made by Gauteng Chairman Mark Posniak that you can rely on the wholehearted support of South African Jewry in your endeavours to create the kind of prosperous, just and peaceful society that we know we can and should be. Ready? Okay. So what um, happens yeah. now? now? Now I'm going to ask you a few questions. So, so. Uh, but you're not asking me. I'm asking you. No, how come? This is unfair. Okay, we can. A constitution says there should be equality. So fine, I need fine. to ask you some but, questions. Okay, I'll ask the first one. <laughs> then we see where it goes. <laughs> um, Mr. President, uh, thank you very much for gracing your presence on our community. I uh, know when we were flying. To Canada, I caught you on the plane, and I said, you've got to talk to the Jews. They're very nervous. And then you, you doubled up. You went to Cape Town. You spoke to them in the synagogue, in Garden Synagogue, and then you've graced us with your presence. And, uh, I'm, you know, I, we really appreciate it very much. And you heard from everyone. And you can see... You can see from the reception here tonight, uh, I think... You know, we first were going to host this at Investec, and then Zev said to me, no, nah, it's full. We need to move. And we had more than double the people. So that just, again, you know, demonstrates the respect that our community has for you and the relationship they've had for you over many, had with you over many, many years. So I think I'm going to start off, Mr. President, by taking us back a while. And we've had a tumultuous couple of years. Um, I think uh, if we sat here a year ago, we were all on the edge of our seats, um, uh, worried about where South Africa was going. Then you were elected as the leader of the ANC, and then everyone got excited. The RAN went from 1411, I've checked this down, to 1156. Um, unfortunately, it's gone back to about 1370, 1380. Um, but that had nothing to do with you. That's got to do with other things. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I think after the incitement, the, rea the reality hit us. And really hit us on how much damage had been done over, you know, maybe a little bit you could say was the financial crisis, but then, you know, in the post-financial crisis era. And that the road to recovery um, was going to be particularly difficult. Were you shocked when you opened the box and saw the damage. <laughs> I can see the minister sitting there proving. This, you know, used to tell us, connect the dots. This now sounds like the Zondo Commission. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will be going, I will be going, so I'll have my moment. But let me start off by expressing my sincere gratitude to have been invited to this uh, wonderful conference and also to say that uh, uh, the efforts that Stephen has been making for me to appear and meet members of the community are continuously paying fruit. I was able to do so in Cape Town and we're going to have a very good meeting with the South African uh, Board of, uh, Jewish Board of Deputies. So that meeting is going to happen and the presence here of uh, a number of ministers in my cabinet demonstrates the seriousness which we sus ascribe to our dealings with the community. So you can rest assured that uh, the Jewish community is a special community that we want to continue dealing with. But I also want to s express a word of gratitude for the work that continues to be done by the community to develop our country and to take it forward. And I say thank you very much for all that work. Now, now the Chief Rabbi and I have, uh, have uh, developed a, a wonderful system of working. We have our Talmud moment. <laughs> so now and again, we've committed to meeting, uh, to go through 
uh, verses of the Talmud. So he's going to give me my own Talmud. And I hope it's leather bound, uh, Chief Rabbi. <laughs> Coming back to the question that was asked by uh, Stephen. I think we've, as a country, we've been going through a cathartic moment, a moment where we, we're discovering uh, what has gone on in the last nine years. And what we are finding is quite horrific. And quite a lot of it was first uh, played out openly by the media uh, and a number of people who've been very brave and a number of people who are now appearing before the Zondo Commission. The latest one uh, is Minister uh, Praveen Gordon, who very bravely stood up and told the truth about what he has gone through. Now, clearly, he's, he's drawn a lot of uh, condemnation and attack from a num number of circles. And those are circles that are still so deeply embedded in what has been going wrong in our country. Our task is to, is to support, defend people like Praveen Gordon and a number of others are going to come to the fore. We should stand behind them because what they are seeking to do is to rid our country of the culture of corruption which had seeped into the sinews of our body politic. And the determination is now strong within the leadership of the governing party and a number of other sectors, including parliament and a number of others, to rid our country of corruption. And I have no doubt whatsoever that we will succeed in this task. South Africa will soon be corruption free. That must happen. So it has been a shock. Thank you. <laughs> I think a shock to all of us. Some of us were suspicious, but it was a shock to all of us. The depth, the depth of the issue. But I'm gonna move on a little bit because you heard Mark, um, you heard the speeches talk about the critical importance of social cohesion con uh, in confronting the challenges facing our country. And I think the, the issue for us all is how best should we find ways of addressing problems of disunity, the racial polarization that we've seen come to the fore and build a more inclusive society. How do we get back the post-1994 spirit of anti-racism and reconciliation and attack, attack rising levels of hate speech? Um, as a Jew, we're always gonna see anti-Semitism and uh, hate crimes, but it's much broader than just anti-Semitism. It's across. I think that's really a big issue for us. How do we get our society back together again and work like we worked in the early years post-1994? One of the key hallmarks of what we've been trying to do since February, and this was really crafted at our conference, the 54th conference of the ANC. The mandate I was given by that conference was to lead a process of getting all of us to work together to build a social compact, a social compact that goes way beyond just the economics, but also at the social level, at the community level, to get South Africans to work together. And that was encapsulated in two words, to lead a process of unity and renewal. And some people have often mistaken that to mean just unity in the ANC, but it is unity of the nation. Now, if we take, go back to February and the State of the Nation address, the issue that we focus on was how we can all work together and all of us can be sent to Mamina to go and do good things for the nation. It also means that getting together, mobilizing society to act against those who are going to be you know, racists who are going to be uh, pronouncing words that are hateful to others and who are going to be destroying the fabric that is so well put together in our constitution. And in many ways, it is also going back to the values that Nelson Mandela taught us, 
to get us, all of us as South Africans, to get on with the task of building a nation and building social cohesion. And I know that has frayed along the line. And particularly in the past few years, we have departed from that cause. And the task that is at hand now is to get all of us to keep to that cause, to go back to Nelson Mandela's values and to create the South Africa that Nelson Mandela envisaged, the South Africa that is so clearly built around the constitutional values that we also cherish. So if we can do that, and I think we can do it, we can get a second chance of doing precisely that and mobilize society. And for me, that's why this gathering, this conference is so important, to see the example of the Jewish community because the Jewish community can teach all of us so many good lessons because you act as a community and you are able to take positive steps to do things against poverty, to do things against inequality. And when certain things are done against what you stand for as a community, you stand together against anti-Semitism, against attacks, that are you know, targeted at you as a community, as Jews. Now, these lessons can be translated throughout the nation, and this is precisely what we should seek to engender, that all South Africans, without you know, consideration of where we come from, what racial group we come from, we should all unite and act against all that militates against the values that are enshrined in our Constitution. I believe this we can do. We've got the way with all and the strength and the energy to do it, and we must go ahead and build this great South African nation working together. Thank you very much. So, so Mr. President, us Jews, we are a sensitive bunch. So I've got to ask you this question, and it really is similar to the questions I was asking you on the aeroplane going to Canada, and that, you know, what assurances can you give the Jewish community, and in particular younger members, that there's a place and future for them here? Yeah. Now, you half answered the question, or three quarters, yeah. but maybe you can just add a bit of spice. Well, <laughs> yes. I'm often pained and troubled when I hear that a number of young South Africans, after being educated here, after the country investing so much in them, are leaving the country to go to other places in the world. And that troubles me a great deal. And by the way, it's not only happening uh, with people in the Jewish community or the English community or the Afrikaans community. Some, even African, Young people are saying, we think we can find a future elsewhere. So that troubles me because this country has so much to offer. It has so many opportunities. Opportunities are wide open. And it may seem to some people that now that we've got a constitution that opens more opportunities, that the space has closed for some. The contrary is true. The space is opening for all of us and we especially want well-educated and talented young people to stay in the country. I was overjoyed when I saw a number of young people uh, who, as I came in, greeting me, and I kept asking them, what are you doing? Uh, they told me what they are doing, and I said to some of them, I want you to stay in the country. So all of us, as parents, need to start encouraging them. But of course, we've got to build an environment that will allow young people to stay. And this is where we need to work together to create that environment together to make our young people stay in the country because they're well-educated, they're talented, they're innovative, and they are patriotic. And we must deepen their patriotism so that they stay in South Africa and make a contribution on a non-racial platform where they demonstrate that we are very different from all other people in the world because we're the one country where non-racialism, the non-racialism project can become a true reality. And this is where all of us can embrace 
this process and build a great South African nation. So let's keep our young people here and make all efforts that they should stay. And Mr. President, in uh, JFK's inaugural speech in 1961, yeah. he, he said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Yeah. I think that uh, the Jewish community has the capability and as you can see, is willing and able to play a continued role in growing and developing our country and making a, gr a broader contribution to society. Um, what role, what do you expect from us? What would you like us to do? Well, it's been clearly articulated by the speakers who spoke on the, uh, on the video as well as on the platform here. There is so much that all of us can do, and particularly us, who are a little bit more privileged than the general public of South Africa. All of us sitting here are better privileged from myself and a number of all of us here. We are privileged. We've been given a good education. We're better off economically. We live in environments where we can say we, they give us a better life. So it imposes on us a responsibility and a task to act in solidarity with those who are less off. And the Tumamina campaign is precisely about that. When Hugh Masekela uh, conceptualized that song, he was saying, I want to be there when you know, a, a person who's got HIV AIDS is suffering. I want to be there when the drug addict is suffering, the alcoholic. But I also want to be there when poor people are also suffering. So the Tumamina spirit is therefore important for all of us, particularly us who are privileged. After the sauna address, I was overwhelmed by the, the expression of so much support by many South Africans who said, yes, we want to be sent. And they kept saying, send me president, send me president. And that's precisely what we're doing. If you've looked at what we've been seeking to do, and this is what will probably define my presidency, I'm trying to be as inclusive as possible, bring in as many people in a number of iterations that we have, in a number of projects. I want to include and involve South Africans in as much as we do so that we can find joint solutions. And therefore, all of us must regard ourselves as being the type of people that J.F. Kennedy was talking about, that ask not what your country will do, but what you will do for your country. Let us continuously ask ourselves, what is it that we can contribute to make this country go forward and to move forward? From a social point of view, from a political point of view, I have the leader here of the ACDP, Reverend Meshwe. Uh, we come from the same ilk. And <laughs> we come from the same ilk, and he is continuously also motivated about what all of us can do for South Africa. So this is a moment, and I'd like the next five years, 10 years, even more, to be a decade of South Africans working together, just as we did when Madiba get, got into office. So this is the opportunity we have. Let us use every opportunity, every skill, every energy that we can, and every bit of the rand that we can to move South Africa forward. Thank you very much about the rand as well. These guys are cutting my time, Mr. President. I can so see I'm that. cutting, I'm going to have to cut a few questions out, but still, I have to ask a couple more. Um, I think narrative is very important to get across a message. And the concept of that came out of your conference radical economic transformation versus inclusive growth, expropriation without compensation versus land reform, to me was more EFF language than Cyril Ramaphosa language. Um, I'm pleased to hear a shift in the narrative. 
but it's very clear for us to achieve our investment goals. Investment, investors want to know property rights are secure, otherwise they won't invest. Can you give us some idea how you're going to manage uh, this thing? I know I've heard you tell me a lot, but I think these people need to hear from you. Yeah. What was discussed at a very deep level at the governing party's uh, 54th conference were all these issues that continue to irk uh, the majority of South Africans, that the economic growth that we've had in our country has not benefited the majority of people. And people have taken us back to 1994. That in 1994, we, we all collectively as South Africans won the vote. We became equal voters. We were given this wonderful constitution that tells us that we're all equal. We've got equal rights, we've got human rights and we can use the Constitution as an instrument to advance our lives. But when they looked, they say, and it's the reality, when they look at their own economic well-being, the majority of South Africans are still way behind and they are excluded from economic participation. When it comes to the issue of land, the land that was taken away from their forebears has forever remained in the hands of just a few people in our country. And they've come to their party and they've said, this matter needs to be addressed. This matter needs to be solved. We cannot move on forward for a number of further years without this matter being addressed. So it behoved on that conference, the 5,000 delegates who were there, representing, if you like, the million members of the ANC, but also broadly representing the 11 million supporters who support the ANC in elections, like it was in the last election. So it behoved on those delegates to find solutions. And the one solution they came up with is that we must speed up economic participation by all South Africans. Now, that is a mandate I was given. And that is a mandate that I'm pushing forward, but pushing forward within a broader economic understanding that what we need to do is to grow our economy, to bring investments, but also to begin to unlock all possibilities to get those people who were previously excluded from the economy to play a role. Women, young people, 60% of whom are unemployed now, many people should be brought into the economy. And the good thing is, Stephen, Many South Africans are very receptive to this. Many people who are seated here today are people who have embraced this notion of broadening economic participation. And that I am really pleased about. From yourself at Investec, a number of other companies that are here, they have open channels, platforms, possibilities from training young people from enabling and black entrepreneurs, from doing deals with them and then enabling them. This is what I must say the Jewish community has been really good at. The Jewish business people that I've dealt with have been in the forefront of economic inclusion and I thank you for that because that is a very good sign. <laughs> now, when it comes, and I know they want us to you stop, but no, 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 leave, leave them, let's leave talk. Them. <laughs> Uh, this is the president and you talking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. When it comes to the issue of land, a wonderful conversation has ensued throughout the nation. There's, there was never a moment when the nation has been in conversation on a particular issue in recent years. The last time was when we drafted our constitution. This time around, We've had the entire nation and many households as well have been talking about the question of land. What do we do? And the realization has sort of uh, come to people's minds that in the end, many South Africans are excluded from meaningful participation in land ownership, land tilling and all that, and we've got to find a solution. And a solution is about to be found. The parliament has been involved, as we all know, in all these discussions, 
and now it has come down to the Constitutional Committee in Parliament making a recommendation. It's going to be debated. And I can assure you the solution that will come forth in my book is going to be a solution that is going to enhance the economic, the economic situation of our country, will not harm agricultural production, will actually be a solution that I would like to see enhancing the economic growth of our country. Last thing that people should not be, fe be fearful of is that, you know, that there will be marauding mobs going around taking people's properties and grabbing land and all that. That is never going to happen. That is going to be prevented, and I will not allow that to happen at all costs. So we should not be scared like Stephen was. <laughs> Stephen was scared when this issue of radical economic transformation was being debated. He had a sleepless night on a flight to Canada. I gave him a lift on this flight to Canada, and I thought he would sleep nicely in this wonderful business class seat. He kept tossing and turning throughout the night, worried about radical economic transformation. And I can assure you, Stephen, we are going to manage this very well. And as I often say, we were taught to manage things by a great man. Nelson Mandela taught us good lessons. And for me, I learned quite a lot of what I'm doing now at his feet. I spent a great deal of time listening to Nelson Mandela, crafting my own political acumen around Nelson Mandela's values, principles, and uh, integrity. So that is going to continue standing many of us in good stead because a number of the leaders in the ANC as well uh, have modeled themselves around the values that Nelson Mandela taught us. So fear not. We are going to manage this whole process very well from radical economic transformation to economic inclusion as well as to resolving the land issue in our country. That is going to be done. Thank you very much. I'm looking at these two, but I'm carrying on, Mr. President, but I'll cut out a few questions. I, was got, I had one there for Mr. Minister of State and Enterprise, but we'll leave that for another day. I think, Mr. President, if we add up the cost, how much the last year, eight years have cost us, because yeah. to me, you know, you, the arithmetic always tells you the story. So I've done a calculation, I've got my economists to do it in case I made a mistake, that if we had grown from 2010 by four and a half, and that's not, we were growing by more than that in the pre-crisis years. Sure. And a lot of emerging markets apart from Rus Russia and Brazil got back to their pre-crisis growth levels. Yeah. A lot of those Asian countries got back. Um, India's exceeding it. Our GDP would have been a trillion rand higher, a trillion rand. Now, if you take a trillion rand, yeah. uh, the minister, when he was the tax guy, he would have collected 29% of that as tax. That meant that Tita, I can call him Tita because he's not here, because uh, otherwise he'd make me call him governor or minister, I'm not sure which one, would have had an extra 290 billion rand of revenue and his deficit was 202 billion. Now, that 202 would have been a lot lower because you would have had extra money over the years unless you have spent it. But <laughs> it just shows you why growth is so important. I, I, but then you had Jack Ma here at your investment summit, which I must give you credit for. I thought, what are we talking about? We must just get doing. But it was a very good summit, Mr. President. And I have to give you credit. You mean credit. the investment summit? Yeah, the investment summit. Where we raised 290 90 billion, billion rand. Yeah, yeah. But they got to deliver. They will deliver. They if will you, deliver. If you're business friendly. Yes. Exactly. But a week later, but two weeks later. You got more for Africa. Yes. We got 6.6. No, South Africa got $6.8 billion. I thought it was from who? <laughs> None from the banks. Huh? From the banks. That's what no, uh, the Premier told me. Those are loans. Yeah, you must talk to the Premier. You must have investment, not <laughs> loans. Yeah. But Jack Moore, Jack Moore at your summit. Yeah. When he made that speech. Unfortunately, he had it on a Friday night at Yukon go to a 
conference on a Friday night, uh. so I had to watch the speech on video. And, and he made three conditions for a growth economy. One, educate your people. Yeah. Two, celebrate entrepreneurs. Yeah. You've got a lot of them in the room here. Yeah. You've got educators here as well. Yeah. Three, build an efficient state. Yeah. These are tough issues that we have to deal with. Yeah. How do you see us dealing with them? Well, those are critical issues. Education is number one. And of course, build an efficient state and uh, open channels for entrepreneurs. Now, education is critical, and we keep talking about it. And many people think that we're not making progress. We are making progress. The progress, yes, is slow, and it is slow because the apartheid education system did a lot of damage, more damage than many people actually realize. The damage that was done by Fervut from 1954, when apartheid education was introduced, right up to 1994, is huge and enormous. But we are working our, our way through that and focusing on education, and quite a lot of our budget is actually directed towards education. It is it's the number one outcome in our uh, plans as a government, that the first thing we've got to attend to is to improve the human capabilities, and education is therefore one, is the number one issue. And the second one is improving the capability of the state. And the state was actually dealt enormous and serious blows in the last nine years, where by design and by intent, they debilitated the capability of the state to be able to do a whole number of things. And as corruption set in, it meant that everything then became much weaker and much more directionless. And we are now focusing on rebuilding the capability of the state and reinvigorating the commitment of people who work in the state, but more importantly, the regulatory process and the bureaucratic process needs to be addressed as well. And this is what we are focusing on as well. And we're doing that both at national, provincial, and local government level. And the local government level is where we have the greatest challenge because we've got all these 278 municipalities which minister uh, Zuelim Kize is trying to get to grips with and in a wonderful way and he's identified 57 of them as needing immediate, immediate emergency attention. So that is being handled and we will continue to do that. And entrepreneurship, it was good to have Jack Ma here because he's just a breath of fresh air and he's, been, he's an inspiration. And I'm hoping to have him here more and more and I want him to set up. Uh, his own uh, organization here. So all those things and more is what we are focusing on. So this time around, we are not sleeping at the steering wheel. We are wide awake, and this plane is flying, and it's got capable people who are going to fly it. Mr. President, they've cut me dead. I was going to ask you another question, but I think you sort of answered it earlier about the role you could play in the Middle East peace process. But well, I'm prepared to answer that because it's important that we should all understand. <laughs> I would like us to understand, and I'll answer it very briefly, and I know that the Jewish community was concerned, shocked, and bewildered by the resolution that was taken by the governing party at its conference. And what we are seeking to do now is to say, does South Africa have a role to play in promoting peace, peaceful outcomes? Does South Africa have a role to play in various parts of the world, but particularly in the Middle East? And our view is that we do have a role to play, and our foreign policy is going to be directed towards doing precisely that, particularly as we take our seat as a non-permanent member of the Security Council. Our presence on the Security Council of the United Nations will count for something because we will 
be promoting Nelson Mandela's values and as far as the respect for human rights around the world, but we will also be promoting Nelson Mandela's values in as far as uh, finding peaceful solutions to uh, areas where there is still conflict. So the conflict in the Middle East is right on my radar screen, and it's an area where we are being called upon to play a role, and we will want to play a constructive role that will bring all parties together so that we find a solution to the problem that seems intractable in the Middle East as well. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Thank you again for gracing us with your presence. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Stephen. So do we go down now? Where must we go? Do we go down? No, no we stuck. We stay here. And me? And you stay there. It's my privilege to thank the speakers this evening, and I want to say thank you to Stephen Kosser first. This evening we are, as always, reminded what a talented businessman you are, but you are so much more than that. In addition to your success, you have demonstrated extraordinary commitment to building our beloved country, and I can think of so many initiatives. We saw one on the television a little earlier, but supporting disadvantaged children with education, encouraging entrepreneurship and young talent, providing global experiences for university students to access ways to confront our difficult past, to name a few. But your trademark for me is how in difficult times you're able to find the glass half full. You represent the role models and business leaders who will take our country forward and we are indebted to you. But perhaps what makes us all especially proud is that in addition to all this, your commitment to the Jewish community is a priority. This evening has been exceptional. Because of your support, the support of Investec, but particularly because of the person you are. Thank you, Stephen. President Ramaphosa, thank you for your frank conversation this evening, spelling out and not shying away from the many challenges we face in South Africa. Thank you for this evening, but more importantly, thank you for your leadership. For looking, for looking after the minorities in our country, including the Jewish community. In the true spirit of Ubuntu, we so appreciate your continuous attempts to build bridges and, of course, your zero tolerance for any form of prejudice, including anti-Semitism. I was privileged... I was privileged to attend your inaugural State of the Nation address in February, where I heard your rallying call of Tumamina when you repeated the lyrics of the late Hugh Masekela song that you referred to in your address this evening, Send Me. And the poignancy of that moment will stay with me for a long time. Tuma Mina, Send Me, has since become a call for us all to selflessly serve our nation. And I want to reiterate the pledge on behalf of, or as my colleagues have said earlier, but on behalf of the South African Jewish community, we want to expand on Tumamina and say to you, Tumanati, take us. All of us are confronted daily with the tangible reminders of how difficult life is for so many of our fellow South Africans. We, the Jewish community, want to support you to build the South Africa we all dream of. President Ramaphosa, to Manati, send us. We have a small gesture of appreciation for this beautiful evening this evening, 
a book that we at the South African Jewish Board of Deputies created on the Jewish memories of Mandela. And the front has an inscription by the late Chief Rabbi Cyril Harris, which reads, Nelson Mandela was shown the way towards reconciliation, how to embrace one's fellows and reach out towards a better future. He has taught us all what it means to be a human being. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you to my mother. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have a very special treat now. We have the learners from the Morris Isaacson School in Soweto. The Jewish community has a connection with this school. Please take a moment to look on your programs and you will see the story of the history of the Jewish community and the Morris Isaacson School.
you, thank you. Good evening. It is an absolute honour to be able to introduce the next part of the programme, where we reflect on and celebrate the legacy of Nelson Rolislashla Mandela in this, the centenary of his birth. To sum up the achievements and significance of so gigantic a personality would be daunting even if I had hours, Zev, in which to do so. Instead, I've had to limit myself to touching on just a fraction of what Nelson Mandela was, what he meant to us as South Africans and indeed to all humanity, and some lessons we can draw from his legacy. To do this, I draw on the words of Barack Obama in his tribute to Mandela. Mandela understood the ties that bind the human spirit. There is a word, Ubuntu, that describes his greatest gift his recognition that we are all bound together in ways that can be invisible to the eye, that there is a oneness to humanity, that we achieve ourselves by sharing ourselves and caring for those around us. This profound African philosophy of community, humanity and harmony has now been shared with the world. Nelson Mandela was someone who lived Ubuntu. By the end of his remarkable life, he had come to embody it and it gave him the power to move mountains. In today's South Africa, it still feels sometimes like we need to move mountains as we face formidable challenges. Steadfastly, we need to go about resolving them, and we all have a role to play in this. We need to learn to care deeply about the well-being of every single one of our fellow citizens. Only once we are able to feel real distress over the suffering of others will we be truly motivating to translate that into practical action? Madiba showed us the way. So did those who fought alongside him, amongst them the revered Albertina Sisulu, the centenary of whose birth we also celebrate this year. And so did many individual members of our community, even if on the collective level the community did not take a stand against apartheid. In 2011, the SAJBD brought out the book, Jewish Memories of Mandela, which told the Mandela story through the lives and memories of Jews, lawyers, politicians, journalists, unionists, academics, student activists, and others who worked with him. It included Jewish community members who played a prominent part in Mandela's career following his release, helping him in the pursuit of his mission to foster national healing, poverty alleviation, and economic development. Over the years, the board has recognized and honored some of these outstanding individuals. They include legendary parliamentarian Helen Sussman, the great human rights lawyers, advocates Izzy Maisels, Arthur Chaskelson, and Sidney Kentridge, the courageous struggle activists LB Sachs, Arthur Goldreich, and Leon Levy, and investigative journalist Benji Pogrand. We are proud that in addition to his achievements in the human rights field, Izzy Maisels was also a past president of the SAJBD, as well as other Jewish communal bodies. We remember these individuals, not in order to indulge in unseemly self-congratulation, but so to be inspired by the example they set and strive to emulate them. Together with Nelson Mandela himself, they showed us the way forward. In remembering them, we commit ourselves to carrying on their work. On his 90th birthday, Nelson Mandela said, after nearly 90 years of life, it is time for new hands to lift the burdens. It is in your hands now. As our celebration of the Mandela centenary, we will now screen a short documentary, Jewish Memories of Mandela, produced by the African Oral History Project. We thank Ava Itchikovic and Mandy I. Jacobson for producing the special film. <laughs>
Pillar's greatest teaching. It's the concept of Ubuntu, the concept of Moja, the concept that he is because of those around him. And those around him are also because of who he is. And in telling the story of this great man's interaction with the Jewish community of South Africa, we're showing exactly how the community is affected who he became, and also how he affected the community and how he affected the spirit of the community and what they did. And then has been projected as a saint and a miracle worker. The one miracle I can attest to myself, and that is he got me to go to show. inside or outside, he said, outside, I've been inside too long. You were brave enough to speak your mind. They were at the SABC one day and there were children coming to see Mr. Mandela and one child was blind. And Mr. Mandela walked down the line of children shaking hands and speaking to them. He speaks to everybody. He stopped and spoke to the child and the boy said to him, I can't see you and I'd like to feel your face. And he knelt down in front of him and let the boy put his hands over his face so that he could feel his features. All these little stories of individuals just doing the right thing to other human beings. That for me is what hopefully we will all come out of this book. My foundation is committed to ensuring that future generations of South Africans understand their history, understand where they come from. And the history of the Jews of South Africa is as important as any other aspect of the history of this country. And I want future generations of Jewish people in this country to know what the link was between Nelson Mandela, this great icon of our time, and the community that they should so proudly be part of. And I sat next to him at one of our Board of Deputies Saturday night event, he said, let me ask you, how many Jews are there in South Africa? At the time, 120,000. He said, I just don't believe it. And he said, you know, that's what a small group of people can achieve if they're committed to something. And they're obviously committed to South Africa, to their own future, and to the future of others. One has to say, Jews were whites, uh, participated in the benefits that whites got, uh, a lot of the white racism and sets of assumptions seeped into the Jewish community as, as elsewhere. But there was enough of the, uh, the legacy, the sediment, if you like, of the prophetic vision of the world. Uh, many Jews joined uh, the labor movement. They came as poor workers, first, first of all. Uh, many were in the Communist Party. Others joined the Liberal Party because of a, a certain hope for something better and a certain detestation of racism. We traveled together on a bus for five years, for the, almost five years. What was most enjoyable was that Mandela, Kathrada, uh, Dumanokwe and myself, the four of us used to play a word game and we used to, it was something like Scrabble, but it was more a, a, a mental Scrabble. We would give words and uh, try to make something of them. And the winner was announced to the entire bus and the bus would clap uh, and applaud the winner. And Mandela used to win quite a lot. He liked to win. And uh, he uh, 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 certainly uh, uh, was able to give of himself. I met him on Robben Island, and there was this tall, imposing man, good-looking, very well-spoken, who thrust his hand through the bars of the cell and said, very glad to meet you. And I shook his hand and said, I'm glad to meet you. Now tell me, 
about the conditions here. The first firm to employ him was a Jewish firm. The lawyer he worked with said in this office, those cups, they're not for black people, they're not for white people, they're for all people. He says those toilets, they're not for black people, they're not for white people, they're for all people. He said he learned his first non-racist lesson from his Jewish attorney who employed him. Very often, the meetings that we had, which were formal meetings, the union building type meetings, were very difficult. The one occasion I remember that South Africa were going to sell a sighter for a gun to Syria. And we impressed on him that that sighter in that gun would be used against Israel. And these are the kind of difficulties that we were able to discuss with him. Well, I, I think Mr. Mandela's whole life as head of state and everything he did was showed uh, many things. One was uh, a respect for other people. Tony, you know as well as I do, but the reason why there are so many people here at this moment is purely out of curiosity. They want to see what a pensioner from the colonies looks like. When you meet Mandela, I mean, he has a, he has like a presence. Actually, Winnie had a similar presence, you know, but it's a presence that you know, the notion of saying hi, Nelson, I just like seems impertinent to any fool, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, interrupting him just seemed very impertinent and out of your place, you know, and uh, people just, just gave way to his presence. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he's a person who, um, you know, had a great capacity to listen for a while and uh, then you know, set you straight, you know, by the time it's finished, you realize that I've been quite wrong from the beginning in my thoughts, you know, and he didn't go away saying, no, no, I don't agree, you know, he wasn't that kind of a character. So I, I um, you know, I think everybody that ever met Mandela was pretty much swept by his presence and his, his authority. Saturday morning, when it was awarded, FIFA phoned us early that morning to say, is Mr. Mandela coming? And we said, only if we're getting it. It's not fair otherwise. They said, that's your call. And at 10 to 12, FIFA phoned us and said you could bring Mr. Mandela. We then knew we had the cup. exhibition of the children at Yad Vashem is completely in darkness. There's one candle in the middle and there are mirrors lighting up one and a half million lights because one and a half million children perished in the Holocaust. And we were meant to go to the next place and we were standing outside waiting for him and he didn't appear. He was still in the children's section. He could not bring himself to leave that section because he has this wonderful affinity with children. He understands what power means, he understands how to exercise power, he understands the limits of power. And uh, he understands the importance of law. Hooking people that are in, in the outreach mode to each other across division is, is the challenge of our society. It is the legacy of Mandela and it is the challenge of our community to participate in that. What we learn from the people in the book, President Mandela as well as each individual he came in contact with, is they didn't, they didn't always do the biggest act that changed the world, but they did the correct thing. They were good to that certain person at a certain time. Never, never, and never again shall it be that this beautiful land will again experience the oppression of one by another. This initiative is about celebrating the fact that the Jews of South Africa have inextricably woven themselves into the fabric of what is South Africa today. Jewish involvement in the African National Congress in the liberation struggle in the development of South Africa as a viable economy is absolutely undeniable. And there will not be a successful South Africa without a thriving Jewish community. And there cannot be a thriving Jewish community without a successful South Africa. And the purpose of this initiative is to remind us about this inextricable link. We need to be very proud of the contribution we've made to South Africa. We also need to reaffirm our commitment to 
In 2011, the South African Jewish Board of Deputies produced a book called Jewish Memories of Mandela, on which this movie was based. We published it with Ivor Richard and the Hizamoja Foundation. It gives me great pleasure now to call on SAJBD Cape Chair Rail Kaimovitz, KZN Chair Jeremy Droyman, to present Jewish Memories of Mandela to a representative of the Mandela family, to Queenie Mandela. Could I please ask them all to come up? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not one for long speeches, but I would like to say a few words of thanks. Mr. President, the South African Jewish Board of Deputies, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, my grandfather above all embodied love, and he had this uncanny ability to connect with each and every person that he met. His view was that if he espoused love to others, then this would have a ripple effect and that love would eventually spread the world entire. This year marks my grandfather's 100 year centenary, and we, we are called upon to consider how we can continue his legacy in the next 100 years to come. We are charged to examine what advancement means and what progress looks like, and we are tasked to define what we will do to cultivate our next generation of leaders. This beautiful gift an event tonight serves as a reminder to my family that Madiba's legacy lives on and it can never die. To that end, <laughs> to that end, my family thanks the Jewish Board of Deputies and the Jewish community for honoring Madiba and help us in helping my family to keep his legacy alive. Thank you. I promised the presidency that the president would be out at half past, so we're really running late. Part of what we've done on our things is to, uh, at our conferences, is to honour the Jews who fought the struggle. Uh, it wasn't always our finest hour, and one of the things when I came into the board, um, it was a little bit of a democratic coup, everyone who knows will know. And one of the first things I did is I invited our struggle heroes to Biacha, to the board of deputies. Many came across, and that was the first time I met Colin, who came, and through many years we became unbelievable friends. Uh, one of the very first things he did, the relationship between the ANC and the Southern Jewish community had really deteriorated terribly after Mandela had left as president, and Colin used his personal uh, contacts to, to help us as a community re-engage. A big one, he brought then the SG Chalema Modlanta to my house for Friday night Shabbos dinner, with then his young daughter, who's now a young lady, and that grew a friendship. And I realized through Colin that we didn't behave the best, that we, we let down. We let down the people who, who, who we should have saved. And I, I apologized at, um, 
I apologise at Lily Lee's fault, not for the Board of Deputies to fight apartheid. That wasn't, that wasn't our role. Our role was to fight for every Jew who fought apartheid, and we didn't do that. And when I met Colin's parents for the first time, Max and Audrey, it was the first time they'd ever met a Jewish communal leader since their sons had been put into detention without trial and solitary confinement. And the anger and unhappiness that they showed me showed that we had made a mistake. And for me, what I saw in Colin, as bitter as his family had been, he never allowed that as a South African, as a Jewish South African, to stop helping the South African Jewish community to re-engage with the ANC. And for that, Colin, it showed me not only what a South African you are, but how you can be a Jew and you can give another Jew. And for that, I thank you. We'd like to bring Colin up and his daughter and his wife to get the award. Mr. President, Ministers, honoured guests, all present. On behalf of my father, Max, now 92 years old, my young 86-year-old mother, Audrey, and my brothers, Brian, Neil and Keith, none of whom regrettably could be here tonight, and behalf of our partners and children and the broader Coleman family, I am honoured to accept this award from the South African Jewish Board of Deputies in recognition of the Coleman family's contribution to ending apartheid and building a non-racial democracy in South Africa. That mission, building an inclusive democracy and a South Africa we can all be proud of, has motivated our family for all our lifetimes, and it still does today. I would like to share some sentiments on behalf of the family. And Mr. President, we almost had to call on your services as a negotiator to help us find consensus as to what we would say here. It was a mini Codessa. <laughs> the relationship between the Coleman family and the Jewish community has always been complex. We are not a conventional family. We argue with each other about many things, like I argue with Stephen. We take our politics very seriously we question, we interpret. In this way, actually, we are a deeply Jewish family. In our horror at the scourge of apartheid and in our activism to end it, we were often disappointed, indeed, by what we saw at the paralysis of much of the Jewish establishment in South Africa to stand up against this constant violation of basic human rights which, re which reached a violent crescendo in the 1980s as the Coleman sons, including myself, entered adulthood. In the face of injustice, directly touching our family with a six-month detention with our trial of Keith in solitary confinement in 1981 and Neil in 1985, and frequent harassment of the family, it seemed to us that the South African Jewish establishment kept its head down and refused to engage with the apartheid government out of fear of attracting unwarranted attacks on the community, on their businesses or their families. And when the tortured Neil Agate was found dead in the prison cell next to Keith's at John Forster Square at the hands of the security police, our horror knew no bounds. Ironically, the Jewish community was both despised and protected by the anti-Semitic apartheid government because their identity as whites was more valued by the national government than their bigotry towards Jews. Silence may have made perfect sense to some at the time to not endanger white and Jewish privilege. But we of all communities 
should have then recognized the heinous spiral of violence and destruction that attaches to defending a system of racial discrimination and the need to speak out against that very system. Yet in the face of repression, whether directed at Jews against apartheid or broader anti-apartheid activists, the community largely closed its ears and said precious little. In this, the South African Jewish Board of Deputies failed its own mandate, as Zev has explained it to me, to protect all South African Jews. In fact, for us as Colmans, in the time of greatest need, our telephones went silent, dinner invitations dried up, and friendships were deserted. Whilst my father, Max, stood outside John Forster Square every day, protesting Keith's detention on his way to work, the Jewish establishment was nowhere to be seen. It was in fact left to individuals with a conscience such as Jill Marcus, Joe Slovo, Ruth First, Ronnie Castles, and yes, Max and Audrey Coleman, and the organizations like Jews for Social Justice to stand then with and sometimes lead the democratic movement. I will never quite overcome the trauma at the age of 18, answering the knock on the door of the notorious Captain Struvik and his security peace colleagues to detain Keith. But what the Coleman family most remembers is the support of the democratic community, black and white. We discovered a community of remarkable spirit, kindness, forgiveness, strength, purpose, vision that came to represent our blanket, our blanket of comfort and support. It was a community of which our current President Ramaphosa was very much a part, as was Pravin Gordon. Today, uh, as they, they worked tirelessly then, as they still continue today, to advance democracy. Patriots all who put country first, community, class, race, race and religion second. That all leaves us now with these questions for the future. Does the South African Bo Jewish Board of Deputies, in fulfilling its core objectives, see the protection and advancement of the interests of all people in South Africa as equal to its own? Will the South African Jewish Board of Deputies now and in the future protect all communities who face repression, poverty, and prejudice, not just its own? And we've heard much tonight uh, pledging the support. Today we can hear a sound if you listen carefully outside the walls of this hall. It is our fellow South Africans crying out for economic justice and jobs. It is the cries of the unemployed and uneducated who also want to claim the share of the economic pie and to know what practical benefits come with the rainbow nation of the great Nelson Mandela and Sir Ramaphosa. We need to always remember that the fight for human rights, justice, freedom, peace, and democracy is both about standing with the oppressed and the poor and also speaking truth to power. And it is about holding leaders accountable. The presidency of Sir Ramaphosa represents a unique opportunity for the government to return to the path of human rights, democracy, and justice. Whilst lifelong supporters of the ANC recognize that the ANC strayed terribly from its historic purpose, especially in the past decade, with the election of President Ramaphosa as the ANC and country president, South Africa now has a historic opportunity to build a future for all. Our president, together with all South Africans of good conscience, represents the best chance South Africa now has to remain united, to prosper, to overcome our historical legacies, and to fulfill our promise. Let us all join this journey to make South Africa a nation of hope, where those who work earn a decent living, and where unemployment, unemployed youth have a share shot, fair shot at employment, where young rural black men and women are not shut out of society because they are born into marginalized communities, where women and the young are, feel, are and feel safe, and where economic dynamism translates into shared economic benefits for all. Our call to Jews, to the white community, and all South Africans over the next months and years ahead is to rally behind President Ramaphosa's agenda of renewal that we have heard about tonight, his war on corruption, and in the process, hold the ANC to account. To support those who are committed to advance non-racial democracy and make South Africa a prosperous, dynamic country. 
to take concrete actions in the fight for economic justice, jobs, home, food, water, electricity, education, and health. Those who have economic power should follow the leads of the likes of Adrian Gore and Stephen Kossoff sitting here, with whom I serve on the BLSA board and in service of the CEO Initiatives Youth Employment Service, where Stephen and I are co-chairmen, and the SME fund activities, to use their leadership positions to truly benefit those who they employ and our wider communities. And we must use our voices to expose and isolate those wanting to steal the hopes of millions of South Africans crying out for the promise of a non-racial prosperous South Africa. Let's defend that vision that Nelson Mandela lived and fought so hard for and promote the vision he left us when he passed on. Let us not allow the coalition of populist reactionary forces who want to capture South Africa as the preserve of elites, whether elites who abuse their, their historic privileges or corrupt nationalist elites, and not let them succeed on taking us backwards to racial division and hatred. Let us remember this lesson. Human rights are universal, not to be applied when it suits one or where it suits the other. Human rights need to be respected everywhere, in South Africa, in the United States, in Syria, in Israel, and in Palestine, everywhere. Every person on earth is equal, and every person deserves freedom. All humans should have full human rights, and the ancient Jewish teaching tells us, quote unquote, the world endures because of three things, justice, truth, and peace. Today, we are encouraged that the South African Board of Deputies recognizes the importance of human rights, freedom, justice, and peace. We welcome and acknowledge recent efforts by the South African Jewish Board of Deputies under the leadership of Zev Krengel to reach out to fellow South Africans. And I was personally delighted to introduce Zev to Chalema Matlante, which led to much uh, further discussion. We hope that this evening is a meaningful step towards putting these universal values at the heart of your programs. Human rights, freedom, justice, peace. It is time for the Jewish community to stand up for the voiceless, just as the Jewish community in its darkest moments had the Schindlers to stand up for them. On behalf of the entire Coleman family, and in particular the four sons, we cannot emphasize enough how proud we are of Audrey and Max Coleman and the example they set for us. In that spirit, we thank the South African Jewish Board of Deputies for this award and recognition and wish you well in the years ahead. Finally, and please hear me out, we ask you to stand in loud applause to acknowledge the sacrifices and heroic contribution to South Africa of Pravin and Vani and the Gordon family, who in the last three years have borne the brunt of their tax and democracy in South Africa, and who this week stood up at the Zondo Commission to expose the horror of state capture and had to endure insults and threats from demagogues hell-bent on dividing this country. Mr. President and Pravin, we stand with you. We stand with democracy. I thank you. Um, just a very quick, it's, it's always very difficult to do a surprise award to the person who organizes it, but there's a, there's a woman who literally devotes her entire life to the Southern Jewish community in South, South Africa, and she got an esteem award this year of the 41st most influential, person, most influential Jewish person in the entire world. The list has Gal Gadot, it has Sheldon Elsa, it has many others. It's her own Wendy Kahn. We want to thank her husband and her children.
We, 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 we have no more time to read up the citation, but we can read it later. I just want to ask if Sean and our president can please give it to Andy quickly. Um, yeah, yeah, give it to Wendy with the president, if you can just come to the side. Quickly. Okay. Um, can you please do it, because the president has to go. Sorry, I'm the one who's been handed the whole night. <laughs> you. Um, if I can just ask everyone, everyone, if you can please stay seated until we've walked the president out. If everyone can please stay seated, president, if you'd like to come out. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our program. I would just like to wish all members of our community a very happy Hanukkah. May the light of the Hanukkah candles bring light and radiance into our homes, our community, and into our country. Travel safe.